hello everyone and welcome again to another I'm almost wondering if it needs its own account, hour. like Twitter I'm account. I'm James Petty, I'm one of your hosts today, and I'm joined as by opposed, the one and as opposed to field. just a welcome hashtag. Alright, 10 seconds. 5, 4, on, uh, 3, PowerShell.org and random. <laughs> Alright, here we go. All right, hello everyone, and welcome again to another edition of Power Hour. I'm James Petty, one of your hosts today, and I'm joined by the one and only Adil. Welcome, Adil. All right. <laughs> that way. <laughs> All right, so Thomas, before you get started, I got to know where did you come up with the title? Because obviously you're a huge Harry Potter fan. <laughs> All right, so Thomas, before you get started, I got to know, where did you come up with the title? Because obviously you're a huge Harry Potter fan. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Sure, having a little lag here. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Just losing MTR. Yeah, I think his Skype keeps disconnecting the. Uh, I'm audio sure the video having a little yeah. lag here. All right. Well, I guess while well, deal yeah, while Thomas gets. Uh, Issues fixed on his. Losing MTR. So what about uh, you saw the announcement I sent out yesterday about the twenty four hour live stream? Yeah, I think his Skype keeps disconnecting the uh, <laughs> audio or the video keeps going. All right. Well, I guess while well, deal yeah, while Thomas gets uh, issues fixed on his end. So what about uh, you saw the announcement I sent out yesterday about the twenty four hour live stream? <laughs> yeah it, yeah so um yeah so working with ryan yates out of the ps comp uk day and as well as uh, robbie from the ps comp asia and so we're just going to take a third third of a day <laughs> to kind of go um you know so robbie will take the first first eight hours and ryan will take the next and then uh, so we'll kind of follow yeah, wrap up today. Yeah, so, um, with, yeah, uh, so working with Ryan with Yates the, out of the PS the Conf US version UK of day and as well as uh, Robbie and from the uh, PS Conf Asia. And so we're each going to take a third third of a day to kind of go. Um, you know, so Robbie will take the first right. first eight hours and Ryan will take the next. And then uh, so we'll kind of follow, wrap up today with uh, okay, with the not the US version, but with yeah, we'll just wrap up the end of the day and have a good time. <laughs> right. Oh, there it goes. Oh, it's talking. It's thinking about it. There. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Every every time. Oh, there it goes. It's just. It's, oh, it's talking. It's thinking about yeah. it. So this is our first time. There. Yeah, it's our first time using Skype. Uh, so the audio <laughs> sources are a lot better though. All right, so uh, Thomas, I guess. If you yeah, know, every uh, every time it it just it's yeah. So this is our first time. Oh, 
Yep. Yep. Okay. How's that? Yeah, that looks good. To oh. me. Put your picture down here. We're cruising. All right. All right, all right. Before the internet just completely dies on me. Um, all right, welcome to Defense Against the Dark Arts for Muggles. Uh, thank you for joining me. Um, this is um, really just kind of a crash course and some, some precursory stuff that everybody should know about there's not any like mind-blowing stuff in here but you're gonna learn something i promise oh yeah that's thanks windows um i'm thomas rainer like adil said i'm a senior security service engineer at microsoft um i've also got a cissp uh, certification um so I, I work in the security space so i spend a lot of time thinking about information security i think a lot about protecting myself as well uh, just as an individual who has things that I care about and access to stuff that I care about, um, perhaps in kind of an elevated way, though, since, um, you know, I work in security. Um, I do want to shout out also this um, Power, uh, bleh, PowerShell Discord and Slack is a great community that you should look at joining. If you like Discord, it's aka.ms slash PS Discord. If you like Slack, it's aka.ms slash PS Slack. Um, and you can join there. It's a bridge network. They're both the same. Um, it's full of wonderful people who like helping you with PowerShell stuff. So uh, you should definitely check that out. Uh, you can find me everywhere on social media at Mr. Thomas Rainer. Um, otherwise, let's get into it. You've probably already heard most of what I'm going to talk to you about. At least you've heard the terms. Um, you've heard uh, about these types of things and maybe in the news or on blogs you read or you've just been around for a while. Like there's not going to be a ton here that you're like, I had no idea that was a thing. But that's sort of the problem is because even though most people know most of these terms and everything already, I bet not everyone is doing all of this stuff that I'm about to tell you about. Like if you're if you joined here going like, oh yeah, sweet, I'm gonna get like three things that I've never even considered that it's gonna be easy. It's not gonna take any effort. Uh, just gonna get to flip the switch and be unhackable. That's not what's gonna happen because that's not how security works. Um, like this is gonna tell you um, kind of everything that you should be doing at a base level that everybody can do for free right now. Uh, whether you work in information security or whether you work in IT or whether you're just a normal person who happens to use computers. Uh, so let's play a little game. Uh, who, like, if you think you're unhackable, probably not many people are that naive. But if you go, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a hard target. Like, people aren't going to get me. Uh, keep score. This is out of seven. Uh, who has a corporate password longer than 16 characters? Yes? No? Give yourself a point if the answer is yes. And you can use your fingers if that helps. I know that, uh, I mean, just don't spell it out out loud, like P-A-S-S-W. Oh, am I speaking my password? Maybe don't do that. Hunter too. <laughs> Who's got a password manager at work? Uh, or even better, just-in-time access, where you check out your access to these different environments. You never even see your password. Give yourself an extra bonus point for that. Do you have a password manager at home, like separate from your one at work? Give yourself another point. Do you have more than one multi-factor authentication app on your phone? If you're going, what is a multi-factor authentication app? Then don't worry, you're in the right place. Uh, but hey, if you have more than one, give yourself another point. Who uses a, I'm probably gonna lose a lot of perfect scores here. Who uses a personal VPN service? You know? It's kind of important. I know you're not leaving your house so much these days, but hey, you used to, and you probably will again. Does Netflix count? Does not count. <laughs> uh, and do you provide false information, like false birth dates and things like that, when you're asked for personal info, especially when the place doesn't need it? Like your Nintendo account asks you your birthday. Do you think Nintendo really needs your birthday? No, they're they're not doing background checks on you and stuff. They're not validating your identity. Do you use real information or fake information? So if you got a seven out of seven or even an eight out of seven, that, that's really impressive. Guess what? <clears throat> you're still not unhackable, but you're a lot closer the higher your score is. Uh, oh, and also, I forgot the last one. Who uses a hardware MFA token? If you don't know what those are, we'll talk briefly about them too. That's 
your last point. So in order to think about protecting yourself, uh, you need to understand a little bit about what hacking is. Uh, and because you're probably thinking like, okay, we know all about hacking for fun and destruction. Like the people who send you viruses that um, eject your CD tray and also encrypt your files or that just take stuff down. And people think that's entertaining and okay, I have a different opinion, but hacking for fun and destruction, right? You're probably also aware of like hacking for profit. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, ransomware started really becoming a thing where your files are all encrypted and then they want Bitcoin in exchange to unencrypt them. Um, this is usually a little bit more organized than just random script kitties running stuff to take you down. Um, but there's more. Like There's also um, an emerging landscape of advanced persistent threats. Uh, information security professionals will go like, it's not emerging, they're out there and it's taking place. But these are nation state backed attack groups that are highly organized. And you go, well, now you've jumped the shark into conspiracy theory. Like North Korea or Russia or China or even the US or whoever, they're not after my stuff. You'd be surprised who's after you uh, and who's after your company. And they might not be after you individually, but they might be after you as part of a group of people. Uh, so in terms of this is the continuum of past, present, and future, largely we're about here, right, kind of on the emergence and um, we're, we'll, we're well into the shift from the hacking for profit into things being uh, backed by nation states and advanced persistent threats where you hear things like, well, they have an infinite budget. You go, there's no such thing as an infinite budget. Well, compared to your budget. Like the government of China can throw infinitely more resources at an attack than you can throw at a defense. And that's sort of the landscape that we're talking about. So we're seeing these things emerge. We're well into the hacking for profit scene. And uh, most everyone's kind of familiar and comfortable with hacking for fun and destruction. Uh, and so when you think about protecting yourself, what you really have to think about is how an attacker is going to make it hurt. Like, what's going to happen to you that is going to be unpleasant? Uh, in the CISSP training material and in other training materials and, and ways of thinking about this, there's this concept called the CIA triad, uh, which has nothing to do with the American organization that shares the same name. Um, these is an acronym. The C stands for confidentiality. Uh, and so what this means is your access to information and the privacy. So if you have medical records... Let's say you went to the doctor to um, get treatment for this embarrassing condition. And all of a sudden that doctor's uh, records are made public and everybody knows that you went for get treatment for your embarrassing condition. Your privacy, your confidentiality has been violated. And so that's the C in the CIA triad. That's one of the ways that people make things hurt is by exposing private information and violating confidentiality. They look at things that they shouldn't be looking at. Uh, the I stands for integrity, which is the trustworthiness and accuracy of information. So same kind of thing. You're going to the doctor and they pull up your information and they go, oh, you're a 142-year-old woman who's somehow also pregnant at the same time. And you go, no, I'm a 32-year-old man. Well, the integrity of your medical record has been tampered with. The trustworthiness of that medical record is a lot lower than you'd like it to be. It's not accurate. Somebody has presumably attacked the integrity of that data. They may not have leaked it anywhere, but it's been uh, tampered with. And then the last one, uh, the A stands for availability. And so you, if you're familiar with um, things like denial of service attacks, uh, this is just access to the systems or the data that, uh, that you're most interested in. So again, you go to the doctor and they go, oh, we have no idea who you are. We can't get at our records right now. And you go, well, did, did you leak them? And they go, I don't know. And they go, well, are they intact? And they go, I don't know. I can't look at them. It's just not there. Uh, that's the availability of data. Uh, and so when you think about these three pillars, uh, these are the elements of your information and systems that people will attack, whether they're corporate systems or personal systems, whether this is your email inbox or your line of business application. Uh, this is how the bad guys make it hurt. They attack one or more of these elements of the CIA triad. 
Let's talk quickly about protecting your company because this is an audience of information security or not information security professionals, but of IT professionals uh, for the most part. This is very much an abridged version of this. This is just, hey, if you're even going to think about securing yourself, you should be making sure that these are at least topics of conversation within your company and uh, a little bit of introduction on each of those topics. <clears throat> to why it matters, you might, well, like, I, we don't process any, we're a construction company or we're a manufacturer, we make widgets, we don't have any information. Every company runs on information. Even the ones that just make widgets or build buildings or whatever like you'd think of as like physical construction every company runs on information whether you acknowledge it or not you have customer data every business that's making profit has customers right and you store data about those customers that hey they probably would like to have handled responsibly you have employee data right people like getting paid do you get direct deposit all of that's stored somewhere and so again you can't just go hey we don't have anything that people are going to come after you have to actually take this stuff seriously. Uh, you have proprietary information and trade secrets. Uh, and you have internal and external communications between staff and between um, your, your employees and customers. This was super embarrassing for Sony a few years ago when um, their internal communications were exposed and what people really thought of uh, celebrities and some other customers and stuff um, like Sony has a movie studio, right? And there was embarrassing stuff about uh, what they really thought about one of the actors or something like that. You don't want that getting out. <laughs> it's probably better not to say it, but you don't want it getting out anyway. It only takes one weekly link in the chain to ruin your company's reputation and to have an impact on your top and bottom lines of your balance sheet. <clears throat> so quickly again, backing up and restoring your data. Uh, this one's close to my heart because uh, <laughs> Garmin is a service I subscribe to. They make fitness trackers and other GPS stuff. Um, they, I don't know if this is true, it seems like they had a ransomware attack and they have been recovering from it for weeks. This is one of those things that having a good backup of your data would uh, help alleviate. If you miss it, back it up. All of the data that your company runs on. If you would miss your Active Directory systems, back it up. If you would miss your communications between clients and not, uh, and externals, back it up. Uh, maybe you wouldn't miss it if it was gone. Uh, maybe it's quicker to rebuild, but most of the time you want to make sure all your stuff is actually backed up and think really hard about what that data is. Uh, backing up is only half the battle. Can you restore the data? Like if you can back it up, great, but if you can't get it back from that backup, then it didn't really do you a lot of good, did it? Again, we're blitzing through this because we're getting to the personal stuff. Uh, data retention, you have to think about like, hey, do, do you need those backups from 17 years ago or the ones from last week good enough? Uh, they should probably be backed up off-site in addition to being on-site so that if your entire building is uh, the unfortunate victim of a calamity of some kind, uh, you can back that up to a new location. Uh, encryption is important. Uh, and what I mean here is uh, just hiding and distorting information so that it can't be read, right? And there's a million different ways that this can take place. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of different systems in place for the different types of information that your company might deal with. It's not a new concept. Encryption has been taking place for millenniums. Uh, this is like hardly something new to be getting your head around. You have to think about not just data at rest, which is data that's on your computer and on USB drives and servers and stuff like that or sitting idle in the cloud, but also data in transit as it's traversing your network and networks that you don't own. It needs to be encrypted at all of those states that you might care about it. You have to assume that you're going to lose control of your data at some point. You just do. You have to act that way. You go, oh, no, uh, we have an impermeable outer defense. No, you don't because you have employees who can get past it, <laughs> you know, and employees are fallible. We'll talk about that in a second. You have to assume you'll lose control of the data. But if you lose control of the data and it's all encrypted, then by the time anyone decrypts it, it's not useful anymore. Like maybe by the time someone decrypts the information about your customers, it's a thousand years in the future and all your customers are dead. Well, it didn't really matter so much, right? Uh, at least not as much as if you leaked it and it was in plain text. You have to to assume you're going to lose control of your data, so you have to make sure you're treating it with respect and encrypting it. 
of protecting your uh, company. A lot of people will buy the new Blinky box that does all the security features of the month, uh, but then prop open the door to their data center. Physical security matters too, because if someone can just walk into your building, they might. Uh, so you got to think about who has access. Your employees, like maybe right now mostly everyone's working from home, but who has access to your sensitive facilities? Are you? What happens if you have visitors or emergency services? What are the exceptions to these processes? Um, what about power and utilities? If somebody runs a truck into the, um, the Comcast pedestal outside your building, what happens? Does everything go down? Did you just experience a denial of service attack and like for the price of a $500 car? Disasters, like this is pretty basic stuff. Uh, like, hey, your data center flooded or there was a fire, et cetera. Um, and remember, when you're thinking about all of this, human safety is always, always, always your top priority. Always. You, like, it is not worth saving your data center if your employees are going to be trapped inside of it, suffocating because you sucked all the oxygen out of the room. Human safety is always the top priority, period. Always. Uh, social engineering, these are becoming a little bit more relatable and applicable to your daily lives as well. Uh, social engineering is really experiencing not a renaissance or an emergence because it's been around, but exploiting technology is hard, right? Like it takes a lot of skill to reverse engineer a program, but exploiting humans comparatively is easy, especially in the workplace because humans are trusting. You're trusting me right now to share accurate information with you. You tuned into a live stream. And we're kind of geared to be helpful, especially at work. If you think about uh, the average person sitting at the front desk at their building, and I come in, and, oh, hey, um, can you just help me? Can you point me to the so-and-so's office? This is the name of a person you know. Um, oh, yeah, so I can point you in the right direction. They want to be helpful because they don't want complaints against them. Um, they're probably, it's probably a metric that they're graded on, um, et cetera. They, people want to help other people and, and provide value that way, especially at work. And that's what gets leveraged in these social engineering attacks. Um, email, which we'll talk about, phone calls, instant messages, spam, ads, everything. Every single way of contacting a human is vulnerable to social engineering. Advertisements are social engineering. They're trying to persuade you to do something that may be against your best interest. Um, so listening to the news can be social engineering, trying to persuade you to do something against your best interests. So the components of social engineering, some of the ways you can spot it are urgency. So uh, you, somebody shows up in a delivery uniform and says, oh, yeah, I'm about to drop this. Can you just help me? Oh, you don't have time to think. Oh, that guy's about to drop the box he's holding. Uh, I better go help him now. There's no time to evaluate what is occurring in the situation. Uh, impersonation, there's always an element of this, like somebody's going to claim that they're with the pest removal people or that they're a delivery person or that they're visiting or whatever, that they're not there for the reason, like they aren't there for the reason they say they're there. It's going to be hard to pick up on, but people are perceptive. Uh, there's always a call to action, right? Like there's always a, hey, can you scan this, uh, your badge and open this door? Um, sometimes the call to action is, hey, can you ignore me? Can you avoid requiring me to sign in? Um, you have a sign-in book that, uh, can you just let me not do that as I wave and walk by? There's always some kind of action that's being requested of you. There's always an expectation of some kind that you have to compare this against. Are you expecting delivery people? Are you expecting uh, pest eradicators? Or what, like, is, is the internet actually going up and down? Uh, what, what's happening? Are you expecting somebody to come today or not? Training makes all the difference here because uh, paranoia is healthy in this respect, but you need an, an adequate real training program, especially one that covers phishing, uh, which is um, a specific kind of social engineering that you've likely heard of. Urgency included here. Hey, reply now. Your account's going to be deleted in 12 hours if you don't reply. Oh, you have a limited time to act on this invoice that's past due. There's urgency associated with a phishing email. Misspellings. Oh, hold on. Forgot my N. Um, one of the, like it's a reality of the situation. A lot of these phishing attacks are done by people who either don't speak English as a first language, or uh, they're in a hurry, or uh, they're just kind of banging it together, they're not very thoughtful. 
Uh, and so misspellings in an email aren't a dead giveaway. Heck, I make plenty of misspellings in my emails. But like if they misspell the name of a company, that's not very likely to happen. If they misspell your name, that's not super likely to happen. Um, phishing emails tend to contain misspellings. Look at the sender information. Uh, it might say, like the name might be um, Bank of America Fraud Department, but it came from boa at gmail.com. Probably not how they would actually contact you and ask you to log into some random portal. Check the headers of the emails that you get sent. Click to expand the sender information. Uh, bad links, like, hey, are there URL shorteners in your email? There is a use case for that. Uh, a lot of people like using them for tracking clicks and stuff like that, but it's kind of suspicious. A lot of the time you can hover over a link and see where it really goes. Like if, it, if you got a, a utility company email, log in right now and make sure all your information is up to date, but it goes to some travel agency website all, all of a sudden, that doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Unexpected attachments, like, hey, uh, am I actually expecting to receive a PDF from this vendor? Does it, maybe I have online billing for my power and my water bills, uh, and they just sent me a PDF. They've never sent me a PDF before. I'm not expecting them to send me a PDF now. Why would I go open that? That's a little, little suspicious. Uh, any request for information over email is immediately suspicious. Uh, reply with your social security number. Mm, I don't think so. Email is not encrypted. Email is plain text over the internet. You shouldn't be replying with your password or replying with your bank account information. Uh, you should never be doing that. And then like the most important thing is use your gut. Don't give in to the urgency. Don't think you have to act right now because it's so often not the case. Email is asynchronous. Email is you receive it, a day or two could go by before you even check your inbox. If anyone needs to get a hold of you urgently, they'll call you and you'll talk to them and you can call them back at the number you know is good for them. They aren't going to email you with a one hour turnaround. And if they do, there's going to be a way around that too. So that's sort of protecting your company. Uh, the meat and potatoes of this is, uh, which is a funny phrase for a vegetarian to say, but the bulk of this is about protecting yourself uh, because you're important too, not just your company. Because you might go, well, like, why would I protect myself? I don't have anything that's worth hacking. If they want the $4 in my checking account, well, they can have it. And, well, like you say that until it actually happens. Like th to say that you don't have anything worth protecting is denial. Because you also have relationships to people that are worth protecting. You have resources. So like you have a phone, you have a computer. Uh, what would happen if you lost access to those things? If the computer that you're using every day to work from home was suddenly completely encrypted and inaccessible to you for a week, what would that impact be? You might get in trouble at work. You might miss a few deadlines. What if it was unavailable to you like forever and you had to buy a new computer and all of a sudden you were out a grand? That has impact, right? Uh, you have access to stuff. You have access to your personal banking information. You have access to your email. You have access to your company, especially right now working remotely. You have access to stuff. You have access to send your parents a text message. You have access to message your wife or uh, spouse or whomever and say uh, you have sensitive communication between the two of you. You have access to look at your kid's location on the track your phone app or whatever. You have access to stuff that you care about and you do have stuff that's worth protecting in every scenario. You may just not be aware of it. Have I been great website? If you're not familiar with the term pwned with a P, well it pronounced owned but with a P, spelled owned but with a P, have I been pwned.com? Uh, they are an aggregate uh, or an aggregator of different hacks and releases of um, different places that have experienced loss of control of usernames and passwords. So this screenshot was taken in July 2020, uh, just last month. You can see uh, in the background here some of the largest breaches that they have, this collection number one accounts. Uh, there's over 770 million usernames and passwords leaked in that. Uh, there's over 300, there are almost 360 million MySpace accounts Usernames and passwords got leaked. And you go, well, I don't use MySpace or whatever. 
Um, some of the more recent ones, maybe you have a Mathway account or a Zoom car account or a Live Journal account or whatever. Um, or maybe you don't, you just used to, but you use the same password as you used to use then too. Maybe you use the same email address as you use there too. It's, it's a disaster. Password reuse kills. If you use the same username and password from multiple websites, this is how people will attack you hands down. And they'll attack you in bulk because, hey, if you're one of the almost 69 million people who had a Lead Hunter account, well, do you also use those same credentials anywhere else? Because those places all got uh, compromised too. So sign up for Have I Been Pwned. It's free. Every time they add um, new breaches, anytime that they become made aware of new usernames and passwords that have been uh, leaked or uh, accessed illegally, um, they upload all of that stuff to their site. And you can type in your email address, and it will tell you if you've appeared in any of the breaches. And you can sign up for notifications so that when they add new breaches, if you appear in any of those, you're notified about it as well. And so as soon as you get notified that you've been pwned, that, hey, you, were, you had a live journal account and all that information, now it's in the public, make sure you're creating a unique username. A lot of, web, uh, a lot of email providers will allow you to have aliases or use kind of like a to add a label or folder onto your email address. Try to make a unique username for each site so it's easier to track who leaked your data when you get spam on your accounts. And create a new unique password. Every account you have should have a unique password for exactly this reason. Like I said, if you're using, like if you're a member of LifeBear and Artsy, and, or LifeBear and, I don't know, um, Facebook, and you have the same username in both, if they got one, they got you on both, and that's terrible for you. This is kind of an XKCD comic that sums it up. Like, people think, oh, hacking is hated. They physically broke into your home. They looked at the book where you wrote down their, your password or uh, posted it. What actually happens? The Smash Mouth message board gets hacked, and they, they try all those usernames and passwords. You go, well, like, yeah, okay, I don't care if my Smash Mouth credentials get leaked online because I don't even like that band. Um, yeah, but if you use the same credentials, on Venmo or on your online banking or to email, uh, access your email, all of a sudden it became pretty uh, this, uh, this Bill Burr fellow is, um, he works at, oh, go away, I know, I know. Um, this is a NIST uh, employee, or he used to be, I don't know if he still is, he's responsible for the guideline that's characters and it should be uh, it should have a capital, a lowercase, a number, and a symbol. And, and uh, we have all come to know and love those password requirements. And uh, those password requirements are terrible because it is difficult for a human to remember. And it's easy for a computer to crack if it's short. A long password, a long passphrase is much more difficult to crack. And it's uh, a much more important, um, the, the length of your password is much more important to uh, make sure, sorry, someone's following me. The length of your password is much more important than the complexity of your password. Ideally, you have both, but a longer password is harder to crack than a short, complex password. Uh, and, but, and so Bill very much regrets his role in propagating that um, misunderstanding that a complicated password is, is harder to hack yourself a password manager. Password managers eliminate pa password reuse because a password manager is a vault that holds all your passwords and other credentials. It allows you to organize uh, and stop typing passwords here. I'll just put some of these out. You're able to have better passwords because they're longer. You don't have to remember them. A password manager integrates with your browser or with your phone or a whole bunch of other places. Um, it makes your passwords available to you uh, so that your MySpace password and your Facebook password and your Outlook password and your Gmail password can all be separate 64 character random strings that you never have to type again because your password manager types them for you. Um, you can back up and restore your vault uh, in, depending on what um, product you're using. 
Uh, you can organize them so that all your social media accounts are together and your financial uh, financial related passwords are together. Um, they're available wherever you want. Uh, if you have Android or iOS, they all have apps. Um, if you have Chrome or Safari or Edge or whatever, um, they all have browser plugins. Um, they all run on Windows and Linux and Mac and all these different things. And so you don't have to worry about um, whether or not you remember, oh, what was my Facebook password? Oh, I made it really long and hard to remember. It doesn't matter. Just get into your vault and get it out of there. Uh, get it out of your password manager and um, and you'll be just fine. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different ones out there. Um, specific recommendations are LastPass, 1Password, KeyPass, and Dashlane. Uh, they all have different features. Uh, like they all have largely the same features. Like they're all password managers. They all encrypt your passwords. Um, they all provide a centralized location to um, keep all your passwords safe. Um, things like KeyPass are, have offline storage, whereas things like LastPass are more uh, cloud storage. And you might get a little creeped out going, wow, um, what do you mean? You're just telling me to upload all my passwords to the cloud? Yeah, I am. I use a password manager and I'm, I'm giving the talk. It's a little counterproductive because you think like, well, I should distribute all of my passwords. I should have them in different places. So I shouldn't put all my eggs in one basket. You're putting trust in the password manager to keep all your stuff safe, for sure. Which is why it's important to pick a reputable password manager and not just use notepad files that you store in your cloud storage. Don't just use like a OneNote folder or an Evernote file that keeps them all in plain text. Use something reputable with a proven track record of, uh, of treating your data with respect and keeping people out. It's a way better option than using the same username and password for every different website that you're a member of. Uh, this, uh, I don't know if you know, the Darknet Diaries podcast comes out, I think, every two weeks and uh, almost a year ago in August, it's a two-part episode, 45 and 46, on a, a group called the Xbox Underground. Is all about um, how they, uh, this, this group called the Xbox Underground hacked into different Xbox developers' um, accounts for Xbox Live, for the Xbox Developer Network, uh, for a whole bunch of different things. And to spoil it a little, the way they got in, they found a message board that all these game developers were a member of all the usernames and passwords and then retried all those usernames and passwords systems. So if they found a game studio, um, let's make up a fictitious one. I work for um, Adil's Games and, and I'm a developer for Adil's Games and I... So I, I'm really passionate about my job. I have a corporate account for a Dill's um, Games Network, but I'm also a member of a community website. And that community website gets popped, and all of a sudden, those credentials are used by an attacker to access my corporate. That's the premise of this entire episode. And it could and will happen to you if you don't have it from happening. So a lot of people use different, different passwords, and their credentials weren't um, weren't used to access corporate resources. But a lot of people did, and they were the ones who provided that access point into their corporate networks. It's a, it's a really compelling podcast. You should definitely check it out. Uh, another password manager advantage, um, you, you guys have all seen like these uh, security crash your car, high school mascot or whatever. Do you provide truthful answers to that? Because you absolutely should not. Because people can look that up. Like you, you can make of somebody's first car if you dig hard, hard enough in their social media, or especially if they're young, they're still driving it. Um, or maybe you are the type of person who needs to know your Hogwarts wand name, and oh, all you had to do was combine your hometown first pet name, make your first car and best friend's name. And then all of a sudden, um, you get your Hogwarts wand name. Well, you just answered five different security questions in public. Like you didn't of what's technically sensitive and protected private information, right? Not not a good idea to answer those things in uh, in public forums. Uh, the iCloud hack, if you remember, that was a few years ago, 
where the premise was for accessed and uh, sensitive photos of celebrities were released to the public, uh, exploited among the security questions and answers because um, you can go find out the name of a celebrity's pet. And so if the name of your first pet was one of your security questions and you answered it truthfully and all you do on Instagram is post photos of Mitzi, your, um, your rat terrier, then all of a sudden it's really easy to find out how to reset that person's password. You don't have to answer these with real information, like I said. Like you can see in this little screenshot, nobody drove Kung Pao Chicken as their first car, and probably not many high school mascots were, nine, or were a hot sauce 9000. They can all be GUIDs, or just random strings of characters. And you can store those answers in your password manager too, because a lot of these things have either specific fields for this, or they have uh, just a notes section that you can append this to. Because you go, well, I'll never remember the GUID. I'll never remember the bogus answer. Exactly, you won't, and that's okay. Because you'll remember how to get into your password manager, and uh, that's where all of this information will be stored. But be careful. Uh, this is just from a few days ago. I saw this on Twitter. Um, this person, um, you can kind of read through it. You, uh, answer your security questions at sign up. So he, he followed the best practice and gave uh, an answer of random characters. What he didn't realize was presented in a list afterwards. Like, is your favorite animal a bird, fish, fish, turtle, dog, pig, rabbit, snake, or this random string? Well, or is the cat or a answer to give, right? So it's not foolproof. Most of the time, people just make you type in those answers. Uh, and that's how they should be be handled but not everyone implements security questions very well so be aware of how to fall into this particular trap uh, multi-factor authentication is a big deal don't let anyone tell you otherwise uh, let me educate you about why uh, it's so helpful passwords suck passwords are a weak form of authentication uh, people have done a whole bunch of things to try to make them better Better, longer, more complicated password managers certainly help, but password uh, is not unique to you or anything else other than it's something that you're supposed to memorize. There's three types of authentication when we're talking about multi-factor authentication. Type one, no. This is a password, it's a pin, like the number you punch in on an ATM. It could be a secret handshake. It's something that you know that it's a secret that exists in your mind and presumably in a system that you're trying to access or in other people's minds. Something you know. Type 2 is something you have. Maybe this is a token, like one of those RSA tokens that show numbers on them. It can be an app installed on your phone, which makes your phone something you have. A specific device, maybe it's a smart card that is, an, that is issued to you. This is a, a physical item. Uh, generally, right, like an app on your phone is technically not physical, but your phone is physical. This is an item that exists in time and space that you are in possession of. And then something that you... So these are largely biometric, right? Like fingerprint, uh, facial geometry, your gait, the way that you walk, is your ear print is even unique to you. It's supposed to be as unique as uh, a fingerprint... Uh, tongue print is unique. Most of the time, this is a fingerprint, a fingerprint. This is an iris or a retinal scan or facial geometry. Like a lot of your, um, like Windows Hello works this way. Um, I, I know the face ID unlock for, for iOS is taking a biometric scan of your face or your iris. I can't remember what part of it it's looking at. Uh, but it's something you are. And the point here is when you're uh, looking at multi-factor authentication is to have more than one type of authentication occurring uh, when it's time to access the resources you care about. So you go, well, okay, I punch in my username and my password. Boom. Multi-factors. No. A username is a form of identification. It identifies who you are. It is not a secret. If you know my username, you know who I am, but you don't know my password, so you can't impersonate me. A username is not one of the forms of authentication, even though it's something you know. It is not a secret, it's not something you have, and it's not a physical representation of you. A username doesn't count. So 
if you have a password and a pin. Is that multi-factor authentication? I can't see the chat. I'm assuming, and it's behind the ones giving their answers, and there's a ton of engagement. No, it's not. Um, a password and a pin are both type no, and therefore are not actual uh, um, different factors. You only have one factor of authentication, even though there are two items in, this, in the same authentication type, is not multi factor because you didn't combine more than one type of authentication. So the have one of these apps on, or more than one of these apps on your phone. Um, SMS multi factor authentication isn't perfect, but it's, uh, it's not the worst thing either. Uh, Ubicode keys or others are hardware tokens that work this way. The point is that you provide a password and then hit a button on your phone. Enter your password and provide your iris scan. Um, have a specific smart card plugged into your computer and, uh, I don't know, maybe you have to give a palm scan on a particular thing. More than one factor, uh, more than one type of authentication is what you're going after here. Uh, and then protecting yourself with the personal VPN. This is where I think we lost more um, in the self-evaluation. Do you ever use wireless that you don't own? Probably not so much right now. Not a lot of people are spending a ton of time in coffee shops and hotels and stuff, but you used to, and you will again. Uh, does your phone automatically connect to any available wireless connection? Because that's not great. Um, if you don't control the network security, and honestly, sometimes even if you do, you have to assume it's compromised and that there are hostile actors on the same local network as you. You just have to. Otherwise, you're not uh, you're not treating your own information and access with respect. You don't know every one of them is me, and I'm feeling malicious, and I'm looking for pe people who are unsuspecting so that I can access their stuff illegally. As I do, you gotta assume that the network is compromised and that it's not a secure way of um, connecting to the internet. A VPN, a virtual private, go between between your device and the VPN server. So if you're on a sketchy network, the data between your device and that server, which is not on the sketchy network, is encrypted and protected. Uh, and then the VPN server will, will relay that information to whatever the endpoint was. So if you're logging onto Facebook, your information goes to the VPN through an encrypted tunnel, and then from your VPN to Facebook and then back. So this doesn't prevent Facebook from tracking you. This doesn't prevent uh, Amazon from uh, embedding a tracking pixel on your uh, website to see who you are, what you're shopping for, and all that stuff. This doesn't protect your privacy at all, but it protects you from uh, being attacks on sketchy networks. Happens more than you think. Just simple SSL decryption stuff. Uh, like the provider themselves may be decrypting all of the SSL traffic that exists on their network and inspecting it because they think they're saving you from something. But in the meantime, it's to them and they just saw your banking password. Well, why should they have that then? Do, do not uh, use a free VPN. This is one where even the password managers, there's free versions and those are fine. Don't cheap out on your VPN. Like, and they're not that expensive either. Like, Don't cheap out is kind of a misnomer because they're not overwhelmingly expensive. But the free ones are going to invade your privacy just as much as if an attacker was looking at your stuff. Um, you want there to be security. You want no loss sold. Uh, you want reliability, flexibility. You want servers all over the world, things like that. Some of them, uh, if you fly back and forth from countries like China, even offer things um, that uh, try to circumvent the VPN um, abolishment <laughs> that they have. Uh, and two that I recommend are NordVPN and, and Private Internet Access, PIA. Um, check those out. Uh, grab one of them. They make apps for your phone. They make apps for your laptop. Uh, they make apps for like every type of device. And, uh, and you should definitely check it out. They have more features than just this, but this is kind of a fundamental point. 
So to wrap up, to protect your company, may, like every company runs on data. I don't think they run on data. Every company runs on data. It's 2020. It's, it's true. Make sure you can back up and restore all of that data that matters to you. Make sure all of that data is encrypted when it's at rest and when it's in transit. You will lose control of your data at some point. Maybe not a massive hack will take place, but an employee loses a thumb drive filled with employee uh, financial information. They leave it on the bus. Whoops. If that's encrypted, not as big a problem. Physical security cannot be ignored. Just because you have all the technological solutions in place, if you prop the door open for the delivery person to come in unattended, you just undermine all of that hard work and money you spent. People are the biggest part of your attack surface. Most uh, intrusions begin with a phishing attack. or It's just the reality of the world that we live in. Exploiting people is way easier than exploiting technology. We're getting better and better at writing secure software. We are not getting better as quickly at making secure people. Protecting yourself, everybody should be doing this because you have resources, you have access. You have access to the people you care about, you have access to the um, financial information of yourself and your family, you have access to the resources at work, you have physical devices that you would miss if they were gone, you have things that you need to take care to protect. Because if you don't, someone might take them from you. Sign up for Have I Been Pwned. It's a great website. It's run for free by Troy using fellow to follow on Twitter as well. And you'll get notified every time he's made aware that your username and password have been leaked uh, from, from some new breach. You can also go and check out um, what else you've been a member of. I punched in one of my old ones and was like, hey, in 2011, Adobe got hacked or whenever the year was. And you had an Adobe account. And I said, well, I actually still use that password for something else. I better go change it, right? When you get notified by Troy at Have I Been Point, go change your passwords. <laughs> and that becomes a lot easier if you're using a password manager. You should not be using the same password for every website and every utility and every app. You should be using different passwords for everything so that it, when one of them inevitably gets popped, you didn't just undermine your security on every other place that you have information. Make sure you're using bogus information in your security questions. You know, as long as it's not being presented in list format, that makes it so that people cannot guess your, uh, your information and reset your passwords unduly. Multi-factor authentication, go install some of those apps. Go enable it wherever you can. Twitter has MFA, are you using it? GitHub has MFA, are you using it? Make sure you have all of that stuff turned on because, hey, even if someone has a username and password, if they don't also have your phone uh, and that's the multi-factor authentication you've got going on, then you're still at least gonna be able to prevent them from having access to your resources. It's not a good situation, but at least they can't go delete all your repositories or tweet a bunch of embarrassing stuff. Use a personal VPN, especially when you're connecting to different networks and systems that you don't control. Um, they have pretty good throughput. You should be uh, looking at this. You should be paying for this. I know it's an ask to make, you absolutely should be. And then last but not least, install your flinging, flanging updates and patches like they come out. Don't be the person who updates because they're released for a reason. You know, like you get a security update because there's a problem with the security of the device that's running the software. Um, that WannaCry virus that came out in, um, I wanna say 2017, 2018? I can't remember now. That did all that ransomware off the frickin' world and it exploited the problem uh, in, uh, I think it was in Windows somewhere. Microsoft released a patch for it in March before the attack went live in May. Patches? You'd have been fine in May when half the world got taken down. Do your updates. Do your patches. At work, at home, all of the time. Always update. Always do your patches. And that's all I got. So 
you didn't likely get your mind blown. Oh my goodness. He told me to do my patches. I've never considered it. Like that's just to underscore. There's no magic bullet. There's no secrets here. All of this is stuff that you can do now, largely for free or with little expense and that you should be doing. These are the ways that people get attacked. The, everything we just talked about are the things that you should be doing first to make sure that you aren't getting attacked because that's some people get in not through some exotic crazy random thing it's through all of the stuff we just talked about so i hope you are already in a great security posture but if you weren't i hope even more that you have a list of things to go do now to sign up for to go check into to go register for passwords that you should go change uh, because this stuff matters and it'll matter to you and you want to take care of it and act responsible you wish you hadn't so thank you very much for joining me i think we've about used all our time up um, but if there's any questions in the chat i'm happy to talk about that too adil or james um, is there anything there or hey, yeah, uh, i can uh, stop sharing if, uh, if that also that makes means. sense yeah. so while you're doing that there is uh, one question that came through uh from kelvin says um how do you feel about I don't hear anybody. Uh -oh. Can you hear me? Thomas, you there? Thomas? <laughs> Maybe. Why does it keep resizing like that? All right, he's just uh, thinking, I wonder if he transferred his audio to a different output. Anyways, we'll, uh, oh, there he is. Can you hear us now? No. Uh, all right, Kelvin, we'll get, uh, we'll get Thomas, uh, we'll send that, uh, question over to Thomas. Oh, yes. Yeah, not a problem. We'll do that. And that's Thomas' face. All right. So we'll see you guys next time on Power Hours. We have um, uh, Josh Dutt. <laughs> all right. That's all the time we have uh, today. We'll I, I catch you guys on Twitter with who we have coming up next. And uh, so we can get Thomas' face out of here. Thanks, guys.